Hello, hello, apa khabar semua? Welcome to the Virtually Peranakan Fest 2021, keeping our spirit and culture strong. My name is Alvin Un from Peranakan Sayang and it's my pleasure to organize this festival for you and also to be your host. Now, we hope that this annual two-day non-stop online festival brings entertainment, knowledge, joy and comfort in these challenging times to babas and nyonyas and those who love the culture around the world as we all come together to celebrate all things Peranakan. Now, come sialah semua datang sini sama-sama kita ya. Kita semua sama-sama, happy-happy, wahi together lah. And today, for the second program of day two, we will be going to Kuala Lumpur to visit Dr. Lee Sukim, who will present Ala Sayang, Reflections of a Nyonya Writer. Now, Sukim has uh, published short stories, essays, articles, poems, and academic texts. She's the author of 13, uh, 13 tau, books, including three bestsellers, Kebaya Tales of Matriarchs, Maidens, Mistresses, and Matchmakers, Malaysian Flavors, Insights into Things Malaysian, and Manglish, Malaysian English at its wackiest. She's also the founding uh, former president of the Pranakan Baba Nyonya Association of Kuala Lumpur and Selangor. So right now, let's all go to Kuala Lumpur to visit Dr. Lee Soo Kim, shall we? Let's go to Kuala Lumpur! Hello, Nya! Apa kabar? So nice to see you! Bye. Wow, wow, looking cantik eh. You pakai kebaya lagi. Thank you. Hi. Only, only kebaya. Bawa? Bawa secret. Bawa, bawa. Bawa, bawa. So, so what, what do you have for us today? How's things? Um, well, I'm going to share um, the influences and inspiration from my childhood and growing up years. And mm-hmm. I'm going to try and link it with my creative output. How growing up in a Baba Nyonya family has inspired my writing. So writing this is a, a very special internal look into how your experiences uh, helped you develop all your stories for your books. So this is a very intimate session, really. Yes, I've never done something like this before. Wow. Uh, growing up years and uh, all right. you enjoy the session. I'm sure everybody would. And so if you're all ready, everybody, let's go. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Really, really sweet of you to give your Sunday afternoon to the session. Uh, and thank you, Elvin and Pranakan Sayang, uh, for inviting me to give my talk, my webinar on this, uh, on this very interesting two-day fiesta. Uh, Elvin, can you please... I'm sorry, I have to go next, 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 right? Uh, so this talk will be focusing on growing up years, growing up in the Baba Nyonya household and how it has uh, helped and inspired me in my creative output. Before my very first publication way back in 1996, uh, there were already women Nyonya, women writers. And here's a, a, a slide of three of them. Uh, Rainbow Round My Shoulder, which is a biography by a K.L. Nyonya, named Ruth Ho. Memories of Nyonya, quite famous, by Queenie Chang. Of, uh, she's a daughter of Chong Afi, based in Medan, Indonesia. Very, very rich, fabulous lifestyle. And of Comb Powder and Rouge, a novel by Yap Ju Kim, who also wrote The Patriarch. Next slide. A Rose on the Pillow, written by a Singapore-based Nyonya, also autobiographical in nature. And Days Gone By, Growing Up in Penang, written by Nyonya, who grew up in a very rich lifestyle in Penang. And since then, she's migrated to uh, Australia. Next slide. So I haven't written my memoirs yet. I, I, don't, I don't come from this fabulous guild, guild um, laid homes of the rich uh, Pranakan families. I came from a kind of middle class family, and I grew up in Kuala Lumpur. Next slide. And the advantage I have, I would say, is that I'm linked to both paternal, uh, linked to both Malaccan and Penang Pranakan communities. So it's important to remember when you talk about Baba Nyonyas or Pranakan, it's not just Malacca, Singapore. There are many, many communities around as well in Penang, Phuket, Indonesia, and so on. And I have the advantage of seeing differences and, and similarities, more similarities than differences uh, between the southern and the northern 
Pranakan families. So this here is a picture of my paternal family, grandpa, grandma, with my father here, his brother and his sister. And this photograph here is of my maternal family from Penang. Uh, grandma, grandma, very strong matriarchal figure, whom I never got to meet because she died after World War II. And I think in, in both cases, the matriarchs were very, very strong. And the maternal matriarch believed very much in education. And also, I'd like to point out to you, uh, previous slide, the very interesting display of, um, of, of well, I can't say costume, right? Dress. You can see the sarong kabaya, you can see the baju panjang, you can see the sangfu, as well as you can see the chongsam. So we are, because we are a very um, hybrid kind of community, we're quite comfortable in all kinds of various identities expressed in our costume. Next slide. So I haven't written memoirs, as I said, but I've written, uh, firstly, first of all, I wrote fiction inspired by the very interesting idiosyncrasies in Malaysia, which led to a, a book called Malaysian Flavors. This was based on the column which I used to write for the star way back in the mid 1990s. Uh, interesting kind of frequencies and idiosyncratic characteristics of Malaysians, for example, if you compliment a Malaysian, wow, you're looking so nice, your hairstyle is really nice, and no la, old hair la. or this dress is gorgeous, nella pasam alam, that kind of thing. So very interesting, um, characteristics of Malaysians. But in between um, essays on Malaysian idiosyncrasies, I also have lots of essays on uh, Baba Nyonya culture as well. Next slide. So after Malaysian flavors, I decided to write on Manglish because there was a lot of interest in Manglish and this led to Manglish uh, being published in 1998, I think. And it was very successful, became a bestseller, and this led on to another edition, which I co-authored with my husband, Stephen Hall. I also wrote a book on Nyonya in Texas as well. Next slide. And after that, I decided, okay, I've done fiction, let's try and do, um, I'm sorry, I've done non-fiction, let's try and do uh, fiction, short stories. And how best to start writing stories, but from, from the heart, growing up in, 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 the, in the Baba Nyonya culture, uh, writing short stories revolving around the cultural milieu of a Baba Nyonya family. And this led to three short story collections, Goodbye Tales, Sarong Secrets, and Manic Mischiefs. Next slide. So um, I lived in, with my paternal grandparents in an extended family setting. Uh, this is a picture of my paternal grandmother. She used to always bemoan the fact that she was not given the chance to be educated. Um, only, I think, at the age of 14 or 16, she was married off in an arranged marriage to someone who was 10 years older than her. Uh, not, she wasn't in love with this, this gentleman, my grandpa. Um, just married off because it, she was from the era where nyonyas were expected to be very good daughters and after being very good daughters, married off and expected to be very good wives. So she, she led a pretty comfortable life because we had an, a servant in Ama and my mother, the, her daughter-in-law, was a very good cook and loved to cook. And if you look at her features, very, very beautiful, lovely features, uh, strong cheekbones, lovely nose, and uh, she was an inspiration for quite a number of essays of mine. I remember writing an essay based on uh, my memories of watching her, my sister and I, watching her dress up in the afternoon. She would, because we lived in a very, uh, in a house which had a very steep staircase going upstairs, she did all the dressing up downstairs, right there in the second hall. She didn't have to go into the storeroom or some private room to change. She did the entire dressing up in the center in the center hall, the second hall. She would stroll up from, from the bathroom, Berkemban, with a sarong around her, her um, well, under her shoulders, and that's all, just a sarong, a casual sarong. And she would stroll to, her, to the cupboard and pull out her sarong. Then she would bend down, bend over and comb her hair and fix a hair extension to her, to her ponytail and tie her hair up in a sango. And then she would put in hairpins as well as the ubiquitous ear digger, the one where you, she will pull out to poke your hand if you misbehaved. After she had done her sangle, she would wear her sarong 
a nice starch bekalangan sarong or uh, under the casual sarong. Some of the sarongs were so starched that when you stand the sarong alone by itself, it could just stand upright like a little dressing room, right? So th those are the wonderful memories of, of her wearing her sarong. And after that, she would go back to the cupboard and pull out her, her, her cotton blouse, a nice cotton blouse with two big pockets uh, in front. So there was no need for any kind of underwear at all. I, I, I do not recall any kind of, uh, of underwear, no triumph, no what called at all. It was all done nicely. And after she put on her blouse, she would just whisk and just with one tuck of the sarong, pull off the casual sarong. So quite, a, quite an art, not having to, to, to disappear, just dressing up in front of the whole family in, in, the, in the center hall. Then came the part which we disliked. But before that, we had the lovely opportunity to do her buttons. Her buttons were not the usual press start buttons, but uh, gold buttons, which we had the, the fun of sort of fixing for her and, and pinning it up with either safety pins or with little, ring, little rings. Then came the part which we didn't like. She would pull out her little um, cup or a little bottle of Buddha Sergio. She'd put some water in the Buddha Saju and put it on her face. And then when she had extra, she would scream for the granddaughter, ah, Kim, I win, Mari. And she would plaster it on our faces because you don't waste such stuff, right? And this is the part that we hated because um, initially it's very cooling, but after a while, your face ends up really, really stiff. So stiff that you can't even smile or, 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 or talk. It was like, I suppose, the Nyonya's way of of face mask or some kind of Botox treatment back in those days. Then she would just toss her handkerchief on her shoulder and amble out to her friend's house next on the next street uh, to play turkey, right? So a very, very comfortable kind of lifestyle. And I wrote an essay on, on this lifestyle called uh, Who Has the Better Life in Malaysian Flavors. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So this is uh, this a montage of the lovely, lovely uh, things. Sometimes she did not just wear the tengsa, uh, the tesa. Sometimes she wore a kabaya. And I remember my memories of her was that she was very particular about the symmetry. She spent quite some time holding the panels of the kabaya edges to make sure that it was exactly symmetrical. Everything had to be symmetrical um, before she, she would pin on the croissant. And of course, this is the very hard powder, not the Buddha Sergio, but another kind of powder that she used. Next slide. <clears throat> and of course, growing up in a Nyonya family, in my time of my vintage, uh, there was always that wonderful culture of food because Nyonyas were expected to be able to cook. And my mother was a superb cook. Here's a lovely painting by artist Tan Gekun, who draws, who specializes on uh, Nyonyas and material culture. So I grew up um, in, in a household that was full of always smells and aromas uh, and cadences and noises and voices, always very, very colorful and lots of languages being spoken because um, grandma spoke Baba Malay, grandpa too, father spoke English, mother spoke Penang Hokkien and my ama spoke Cantonese. And there was always this a flow of different languages and wonderful smells coming from the kitchen. And I think uh, a lot of this is permeates itself into my writing, in my short stories. Every morning, there was always a, a pot of coffee. It wasn't the special ones nowadays where you have this uh, special sachets and all that. And all that. It was just a pot of coffee, and the pot of coffee stayed there all day long, and we just helped ourselves to that pot of coffee. And there were about five meals a day, breakfast, lunch, tea time. Sometimes mother would make goreng pisang or that wonderful yam and koi bakul. Then there was dinner. And these meals were not just like spaghetti or, or sandwich. It was spread, you know, as well as with the ubiquitous uh, sambal blachan. And sometimes there was supper as well. So we always had lots of people dropping in, uh, visiting us, visitors, friends. And on top of all this, we also had the itinerant hawkers who would come by, like the Tok Tok man, uh, the Char Siu Pao man, and like the Dim Sum man, the Char Kway man. So there's always a whole wonderful uh, culture of food. Next slide. Now, uh, for this talk, I scoped through all the family albums trying to look for photographs of the food, of the feasts that my mother cooked. 
but there wasn't a single photograph. I don't know whether you have any photographs of the foods cooked during uh, my mother well, that time, that era. Um, and also, I could not find any photographs at all of the nyonyas or, 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 or my ama and my mother uh, pounding sambal blachan. I remember my, my ama was very good at grinding the, the rumpa. Um, no photographs at all. Very different from nowadays, where before you eat, you are, sub you, you are expected to photograph uh, the, the feast. I recall not too long ago, we were in, in a Thai restaurant and the food that was brought up was just wonderful, wonderful spread and we wanted to give homage to, to the spread by starting on the food straight away and the waitress said, I'm not taking a picture. So oops, so we had to take a picture. So anyway, these are photographs of the food which I cooked and again, uh, the lovely exposure to both communities, uh, Ota Ota, Penang style, learned from my mother, Buakala is Malacca, Malacca origin, origins, learned from my mother who learned it from a uh, grandmother, and of course the sambal blachan. Uh, so I also like to try to use the traditional techniques, uh, and when I've got time, I try to pound the sambal blachan, but I'm a nyonya of contemporary times. I don't have all the, the, the privilege of so much time as in the past, and I do not hesitate to use the food processor to zip my rumpas. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so just a very brief example of, of an extract of how uh, growing up in, in a Nyonya family, growing up uh, in, in that kind of household, how it has uh, inspired my writing. I won't read all of this. Just very, very briefly, just some extracts. To this day, I can still smell the sounds, the this, this smell, the smells. Hear the sounds. I can still picture Mama sitting on a low wooden stool in the chim chair, a pair of pincers in her hand, plucking away the fine hairs of the duck for the etik team. So a must for all Pranakan reunion dinners. Uh, next paragraph. I can see my Ama squatting by the tempayan, washing the pig intestines spread out over the bottom of a round basket, cleaning them many times for the pork liver balls dish. In the last sentence, there were no written recipes. The recipes were all stored in Mama's head and all the ingredients were measured the aga aga way. <clears throat> Coming to that, the aga aga way. Next slide. So I wrote an essay called Cooking the Aga Aga Way, which was published in the Star as well as in the Malaysian Flavors later on. And um, I'm sure you know what, well, known as the Babas here, I'm sure you all know what's Aga Aga Way. Uh, the best compliment someone can give you when they come to your house from a Baba Nyonya is, wow, very good. As good as my mother's or as good as my grandmother's. That would be the best compliment. It's never the best. It would be as good as, right? And... Uh, Initially, when I was in my 20s, I wasn't so interested in cooking nyonya food. But when I reached my 30s, I realized that this is very uh, precious. It's wonderful. It's not so well known. Um, and I wanted to start learning from my mother how, how to cook these dishes. And she, she taught me and I decided to record some of the recipes. Now, this was the hilarious part because every time when I asked her exactly how many uh, shallots do you use for, for the for the honke or, or, or the or the buah kolak, she said, uh, aga, aga. And I remember a friend of mine who loved my mother's uh, chili prawns recipe, wanted to know exactly how many chilies my mother used. And she would say, aga, aga, la, you know. And then my, my friend says, no, no, how many, how many inches, how many inches is the, is the, is the, is the chili? And my mother would say, aga, aga, buah keras, uh, aga, aga, la, about nine, ten. No, 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 auntie, you have to tell me exactly how many uh, cm, how many inches is the, is the, uh, is the boa karas. So that was my mother's style, the size of my tongue, a pinch of salt, a toss of, a toss of sugar, a fistful of, of, uh, of um, a fistful of what, of boa karas, two sandals full of, of cooking oil, and 50 cents tauge, that was during her time, you know, what is 50 cents tauge now? And some time ago, I decided to try and cook, uh, uh, make pai tea, top hats, using my mother's recipe. Because the commercial ones, you can get the commercial ones nowadays, but they're kind of hard. Hers is really, really wafer thin. So I pulled out the recipe book where I had recorded her, her recipe. And what did I find? 30 eggshells of flour. She used eggshells as a, as a measurement. So my, my contention here uh, is that aga aga, the only English equivalent really is guess, 
guess, right? Agak means guess, but it is not guess, guess. So I say that there's no English equivalent. Uh, we Baba Nyonyas know it. When you say Aga Aga, it is not guesswork. It is estimation based on years of practical experience and on a very uh, a well earned sense of intuition when we say Aga Aga. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, I also wrote about the Pranakan dining table where, as I said just now, nowadays when you sit at the Pranakan dining table, I picture, 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 but in those days, uh, you always give respect to your to your older older people. You get the oldest to sit down. Not not women first and gentlemen later, but the oldest first. So the most senior person sits in the top at the head of the table, followed by the others. And after sitting down, um, we were expected to address each person by order of seniority. Kung makan, po makan, papa makan, mama makan, and so on. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Um, I grew up in this house on Sinchuki Street. It's one of those old houses, the very long kind of pre-war houses. You'll, you'll, see, you'll see them still there on Sinchuki. Uh, and they look something like also the houses in Jalan, um, Jalan Bukit Bintang, I think. Um, and you can see the uh, very interesting tiles there, beautiful blue, amber and brown tiles. Now, another hint to people living in interesting old houses, when we take photographs, we tend to just take photographs of the people, right? What you have to do, I think, if you want to pass on memories of, of your houses to your, to your progeny, is to take photographs of the houses, the tiles, the roof, the, the, the beams, the, the whole appearance, because I couldn't, again, find any picture of my house, the entire house. It's always pictures seen this way. You can see the curtains, the, the glass, uh, stained windows, the center divider. You can see my grandpa here in the sarong, and that's what Babas wore in the past, sarongs in the house, casually, and only outside the house, they do not wear sarongs, right? And this is um, the bathtub in those days, sorry, in Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it's just me and my sister sitting in a, I think it's a tin or aluminum bathtub. That was the bathtub of our time in the Chimchan, which Tian talked about just now, a very useful functional place where I've got memories, wonderful memories of, of well, having baths there, seeing grandma sarongs um, on bamboo poles hanging out in the Chimchan, and all the giling rumpa were done, were done there as well. And so when, when uh, my ama comes to empty the bathtub, if you're still sitting there, she'll just pour you out as well, the baby with the bathtub water, okay? Next slide. And upstairs, upstairs, there was an interesting little peephole in those houses in those days. And if you go to the Baba Nyonya Museum, you'll see this peephole as well. And here's the peephole. Can you see this? It's here. So very useful. I don't know why the Nyonyas uh, and Babas had this uh, feature in the houses. Probably, uh, well, as, as Chen would say, it's a CCTV of those days, right? You just have to look down the peephole to see who is downstairs standing at the veranda. If it's someone you, 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 you would welcome to the house, you open the door. If not, you just keep the door shut. And this was taken when I was 20 years old. Um, and it's the only picture of the people. And my most recent story, uh, when Kabaya Tales became a bestseller, with two more new short stories, I wrote a story of the people and all the wonderful tops of heads which I could see from the people and how one day I saw a very interesting um, um, phenomenon through the people. Very strange supernatural phenomenon. And also this is also in a bedroom and I've got another interesting story to tell which again I translated um, into a short story also in the peephole where I was asked after my grandmother had passed away to sleep on the bed which she had vacated <laughs> in the corner of the room. Mother says okay um, it's 10 days and over since grandma passed away you sleep in that bed there in, in that corner where grandma used to sleep. And I said, oh, that's where, that's where Papa used to sleep. She said, never mind, it's okay now. You know, we've done all the rites and rituals. And I still recall that night, I, I woke up and saw a shadowy ghostly figure standing right beside me. And it was a, 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 a ghost, the ghost of my grandma. <clears throat> and she was just in her baju pende, a white baju pende, a sarong and sort of just the top, still in the sangol and say, eh. 
she wanted to get back into her bed. And I was terrified. I said, oh, no, no, you go tell grandma. Uh, you go and tell my mother. She told me to sleep here. And that was translated into a short story in the people. Next slide. So it's a, a, a lovely multicultural kind of influences. Um, the, the Baba Nyonya culture, where form is very Chinese in, in nature, respect for one's elders, importance of the family structure, filial piety, honoring one's ancestors, and the essence is very multicultural. A lot of uh, Nusantara influences, Malay influences, Javanese, Thai, um, lots of multicultural flavors, lots of languages, aromas, very earthy bibics with very interesting swear words. Uh, love for color, vibrance, love for food, dance, music, geography, right? And this is a picture of uh, my young, my brother, doing a stroja during Chinese New Year. Again, you see, Baju, uh, Sarang Kabaya, Chong Sang. So no hang-ups, we just sort of embrace, adapted, assimilated through the years, whatever influences we like. And there's no, there's no mother-in-law from China telling you, no, Liko Mahai Tong Sang, you know, or no mother-in-law from 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 a local mother-in-law. Eh, any any bukan any tabato. There's no one telling you telling the nyonas in those days what to do, and I hope it will continue to be that way. So they innovated, adapted, assimilated, and because of that, we've got a very interesting, open-hearted, uh, colorful kind of culture. Next slide. <clears throat> And this is a picture of a Malacca clan. Sometimes, uh, every time when you show a photograph of your clan, there'll be a lot of bao bao bachang coming to tell you, hey, you know, that one's my brother-in-law's uncle, you know, and so on. This is a picture of my grandpa, paternal grandpa's brothers, their wives, and their children. And we used to make many visits back home to, to uh, grand uncle's house in, in Malacca. And I got to witness wonderful, wonderful um, dancers and and lots of uh, interesting phenomenon from that part of the world. Next slide. And also, there are storytellers in my family, lots of wonderful storytellers. My mother, of course, was a great storyteller. My Sa'i, my mother's third sister, my two uncles who have been with me all the way at all the milestones of my life at, and my book launches. This is Uncle Fu Yet Ki in Singapore, book launch of Manic Mischief. Uncle Fu Yet Chin um, at the book launch of uh, Malaysian flavors. And this is my beautiful auntie, my father's sister, um, Auntie Mailing. So sadly, all of them have passed away except my auntie, this very wonderful auntie who's still, who is very IT savvy, who skypes me from Melbourne and tells me stories of, of, of the past. Uh, and so I'm much indebted to the storytellers in my life. Next slide. And also, um, back in the past, in my childhood days, um, baby boomers unfortunately have got all the photographs in black and white, not in color. She was also quite an interesting lady, and uh, she told us, told me the story, told my sister and I the story of how she longed to go back to visit her father in China, and finally she managed to save enough money to go back to China. And it was a dream of her father to own a pair of Fung Kiong slippers. So she made sure she brought along a pair of Fung Kiong slippers. And when she arrived home in the village, all the villagers came and they got a little share of presents from her. And the father was just waiting and waiting for his turn. And finally, when it came to his turn, she took out the box of Fung Kiong slippers. Both of them were on the, on the brink of tears because she had packed in two left, left foot slippers, not right and left, just left. Interesting stories at least. And that's me, my Mohican hairstyle. Okay, uh, thanks, Elvin. It's okay, next slide. So from all these um, interesting interactions, growing up years, inspiration, a whole kind of like cultural ethos of uh, wonderful multicultural flavors, I wrote my short stories. Uh, themes of uh, family, of love, loss, of uh, betrayal, of identity crisis, of family feuds, and so on. Uh, Box in Bibik is about uh, 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 an old nyonya who liked to keep all her things and all her barang barang all over. The money was never in the bank, it was under the mattress and in the pillow. Um, and a promise is a promise is inspired by uh, a, a woman who kept giving birth to lots of daughters. And in those days, it wasn't so uncommon 
when you've got many, many daughters, uh, it, didn't, it doesn't mean that they don't love the daughters. But sometimes, in the case of this particular Nyonya, she had like five daughters. And so there was this barren uh, auntie up in the north who couldn't have any children. And so next time you have a daughter, you give to me, okay? And, uh, and this Nyonya said, okay, okay. But she had two sons. But eventually had a daughter and she gave the daughter to the um, to that Nyonya. So it wasn't quite so uncommon then. And Heaven Has Eyes uh, is inspired by, you know, in those days, <clears throat> uh, grandma had an almanac. And when you have some strange animal coming to the house, you would go to get the almanac and look up the number and buy uh, empat eco, right? And if you had a big black or brown moth coming and settling on the wall of your house, then everybody gets a bit worried because usually we think that that person is somebody else, is somebody in the past life has come back to check on the family. Heaven has eyes. Next slide. And um, I didn't, of course, I didn't, I wasn't around during the Japanese occupation, but again, inspired by very interesting stories which are told to me by my auntie, my, my, my uncles, my mother. Uh, of course, stories of the horrible torture, frightening stories. One uncle was tied up with the hands and legs and tortured in the Lee Rubber building. Um, but luckily, I don't think we lost any family members. But they were also very kind Japanese officers. Uh, and, and my mother told me the story of how there's this Japanese officer who was very drawn by the shrine in their veranda because probably he prayed to the same, uh, probably was a goddess of mercy or the Buddha. And uh, he would, um, he was drawn to it and eventually he came to the house and asked for permission to pray to the shrine. And then he peeked inside and sort of liked the interior and got into the house. Of course, my, my grandmother freaked out, pushed all the, 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 uh, the older daughters into the back of the house and pushed out the youngest one who, was, who hadn't reached puberty yet, who could speak in a, a bit of Japanese because they had to learn Japanese then. And the, that Japanese officer sort of enjoyed coming to, to the house, visiting the, the household, sitting there, and he told grandpa that he actually was Taiwanese, conscripted. Um, there was a kind of conscription from the Koreans and the Taiwanese. And eventually, I think this is what I remember, he pasted a scroll on the door of the house and they were never troubled by the Japanese soldiers after that. Koi Brothers is a fascinating story of which I published in Manic Mischief. Fascinating story of how my poor grand, nonna grandmother had to survive the World War II, Japanese occupation, rations, not enough food. And she used, what, what do you use on? What do you turn to in times of need? You turn to your cultural heritage. And she made wonderful, wonderful uh, nonna koi. So she made Nyonya Koi and got the two boys, the two young little boys, 11 and 12 years old, to cycle out selling the Nyonya Koi. And eventually she got ambitious and started to get them to sell her Asam Laksa. And one day the Asam Laksa, the bicycle toppled over and all the Asam Laksa was spilled and the boys were terrified that they would get a beating. So all these I sort of twist into interesting little short stories. Next slide. <coughs> And the school that I went to was the, book, the Bukit Bintang Girls' School, a very wonderful premier girls' school in Kuala Lumpur. Unfortunately, it is now the pavilion. <coughs> um, and we had an excellent headmistress, Miss Cook, who was strict, strict, but very fair disciplinarian. And it was very much into um, encouragement of the arts. Uh, lots, of, lots of us sort of grew very fond of literature, English language, there were lots of concerts, theatres, plays, dramas, choral speaking competitions, and very much an ethos of, um, of, of love for literature and drama and theatre. So uh, literature then was very Western canon centric, tended to be very focused on, on Western on literature texts from the West, from America, from England especially. So I was very familiar with, well, um, Thomas Hardy, Shakespeare, um, Thackeray, and Lord Byron was my fav favorite poet then, and so on. We were not exposed to new literatures at the time. And so from this world um, of a rather Western English-centric kind of education, I, I straddle both worlds very easily, move from one world to the other, back home to my, next slide, <clears throat> next slide, back home to my, Babanyonya household, where there were all these languages and dialects being spoken, uh, pantang larang, grandpa would say, don't open the umbrella, 
uh, in the house. Like, why ever not? Because a snake will come in. Cannot sing in the kitchen. Grandmother wouldn't allow us to sing in the kitchen because um, it's bad luck. Penang auntie, when we visited her in Penang, says, cannot stack the plates on the table. So you need will bring bad luck. Uh, cannot go and disturb the, the, the garden, cannot go and pluck leaves uh, in the evening or at dusk because also very, very bad. And lots of pantang larang. So it was a very, it is, it is a very colorful um, kind of multicultural culture with lots of multicultural influences. Uh, but there was no problem or no hang up. So, oh, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this Chinese? Is this Malay? No such thing, you know. We just moved and accepted and, and went with the flow. Uh, I talked about this in a, in a webinar for PPB and KLS two weeks ago, where um, another, another story I can share is that I had an auntie who liked to make, who wanted to make tortoise soup, right? So she bought a tortoise from the market and she chopped off the legs of the tortoise. And unfortunately, when she was pregnant and when she gave birth to the child, the child had arms that looked like a tortoise. And the nonia says, oh, no, you know, that kind of thing. And you don't have an English word for that. And of course, the spirit world, um, an uncle of mine who was a Boy Scout master, uh, took his troop of Boy Scouts into the jungle for a camping trip and decided to catch some, some was it frogs or snakes? Oh, frogs, I think. And decided to catch frogs and skin the frogs and sort of cook the frogs over the campfire. And um, well, they came out of the jungle alive, but later on he became very, very ill and almost died. Uh, so the, the, the babies of the past believe that there's some kind of spirits, there are spirits and that you have to respect the spirit world. Next slide. <clears throat> Growing up years, haha. <laughs> um, the non, the bibics of the past, well, my family were very prudish, maybe because of the influence of Queen Victoria, um, and very very prudish, and they never ever talked about sex, so we never knew much about it. And even when we reached puberty, we were not told, we were not informed, we were just told to get on with it. Uh, there was no like sit you down and tell you the, the the story about the birds and bees so we in my family we were not told much at all so i, I remember looking forward to my science class where there was one page in the biology textbook well it was biology physics and chemistry all combined in the book and i was looking forward to this particular section um, on fertilization it, it featured a rabbit but unfortunately, when the when the teacher came in, she says, "I'm not going to talk on this. If you want to find out, you go read uh, read up in the library." So that was sex education in the 70s for me, at least. Next slide. Okay, so identity. Um, kings, we are called, we were called in the past kings Chinese. Many of us are Anglophiles. Uh, my father could not speak any Chinese. Uh, OCBC, Orange China, Book and China, multiple identities, and so on. But I think um, that. We, we, I, when I was young, I remember reading about um, Heidi in Switzerland, and I said, how nice to just be grounded into one stable identity, just one prison. But now I celebrate, I celebrate the multiple identities that I'm exposed to. I'm comfortable in whatever context, Chinese, Malay, Spanish, Hispanic, uh, English, America, because we, we, have, we are able to see things from so many other prisms so many prisms of life, and it makes you actually more open-minded and more tolerant. Next slide. And Papa, um, a wonderful, wonderful Baba, wonderful man, uh, who instilled in us the love for nature, the love for the seaside, took us to the seaside every, every holiday, and was always uh, helping other people. He had a nickname, he was called Vampire, because he was always getting going around the office asking people to donate blood right and his very last breath was spent uh helping someone he went ran across the road to help his friend and in the same moment as the friend died he too passed away so it was a very very sad and tragic story which i wanted to write but couldn't couldn't find the the inner inner strength to write but in the end i decided to write this short story called true lara's eyes in manic mischiefs thank you next slide 
So write stories from your own heart, your own cultural space. I am in awe of people who can write from another cultural space. For example, Anthony Golden wrote about the geisha, and some people write uh, and they trans transform themselves and put themselves into another space. But I, I am comfortable writing from my own cultural space. And I share this in my talk, uh, Nyonya Journey, which has garnered a lot of interest, 42,000 views. You're most welcome to Google to Google it and, and, and hear it. Um, I don't think I've got time to do readings, right, Alvin? So what I wanted to say in, in this essay, those three special words is that uh, the Nyonyas on my mother's time, love was a performative act. It wasn't verbal. You don't go down and say, oh, I love your mother, I love your daughter. It was never said. And in fact, when I graduated from my master's <clears throat> at a convocation ceremony, I went up to her and said, thank you, Ma, I love you. She said, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't, it, it, you don't need to express, you don't need to express it. But the essay was talked about how when she was uh, on the deathbed, when she was about to die, uh, I, I, I said those words, I love you. Those three special words. Next slide. Um, so words, ideas, memories, and stories are the paths that guide my steps. And those of you who are interested uh, to know where to get the books, this is a list of books here. Next slide. So thank you very much for your time. If you've got questions, please, I do welcome questions. Uh, if you want to follow me, I'm on Facebook, Lee Su Kim author. And next slide. Thank you very much. I wish all of you a wonderful weekend and uh, do stay tuned. Thank you. Wow, what a wonderful sharing. Thank you so much, Su Kim. That was so personal in your in your sharing because it's something that uh, we do not see or we do not know and now we have a better understanding of where you get your inspirations from it's indeed very uh, personal and thank you so much for that fa fantastic sharing what's going on is on the side of the comments section that they're, they're having their own conversation about what you're talking about so it's fantastic to to read through unfortunately uh, we don't have enough time to go through all of them but one funny uh, one that uh, actually was shared was about the the shoes, the the, the two left uh, feet. So I thought that was uh, quite interesting. So this was the comment. Next time someone who doesn't want to dance say they have two left feet, we know what Kaso to give them. I thought that was hilarious. Thank you so much, Angela, for that sharing. I mean, for those of you who want to read it, please read it in the comments. I think that's all we have once again. Thank you so much, Sukim. You've been a wonderful presenter. Thank you so much for your presentation and your time as well presenting this. Well, thank you, everybody. So, that's the end of uh, this particular program. Thank you, everybody, for joining in in your comments and joining us as well. Do join us for our next program. It's happening in just a short while at 3 p.m. Sambut Tawon Baru, applying traditional practices in the new millennium with Cedric Tan. Yeah, kawan gua. So thank you for joining us once again here at Virtually Peranakan Fest 2021. Let's all keep our culture and our spirit strong. Thank you, everybody. Take care. <laughs>